Good morning and good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to a LexisNexis complimentary webinar entitled Starting Your Own Law Firm, What They Didn't Teach You in Law School. Before introducing our speakers, we have a few announcements. Today's program is not eligible for CLE credit. For our phone participants only, if a problem arises during the program, please dial star zero for the operator. We will be using the hashtag at LexisSmallLaw to have a conversation on Twitter during today's program if you're interested in joining us. Please take note of the survey that is available to you at the conclusion of today's webinar. We ask that you please complete it as it provides excellent feedback for us so that we may continue to bring you outstanding programs that meet your needs. Our speakers today welcome your questions. You may submit your questions via the Q&A section of the platform throughout today's webinar. We will try to address as many audience questions as possible, but please keep in mind that all questions may not be answered due to time constraints. No questions will be asked verbally. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. James Hart is the founding attorney of Hawthorne Law, specializing in intellectual property and small business law. He is the founder of Legal Marketing Made Easy website and podcast a thriving and fast-growing community of lawyer entrepreneurs who are looking for more success, more productivity, and more time. John Skiba started his solo practice just 18 months out of law school and started a second solo practice, ConsumerWarrior.com, in 2011. He currently practices law at the Skiba Law Group. John is the founder of JD Blogger, a weekly podcast on marketing and practice management, helping lawyers take control of the marketing of their own law practices, building a thriving and profitable law firm. We thank Jim and John for their time in preparing today's webinar. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. All right, this is uh, John Skiba, and I'm going to start us off. And I appreciate Lexus and Nexus uh, putting this together. I think that uh, solo practice is something that uh, it, a lot of attorneys are involved in, and I think most of us think about it at one point or another that we want to start our own practice. Uh, I recently saw a study that said 75% of attorneys work in private practice, and 50% of those are solos. So I, I think this is really needed information because it's it's not something that we generally get in law school, and a lot of us are looking for different resources to uh, be able to start our own practice. Um, in, in addition to the intro, which they just provided there, uh, my background is I've been practicing law for about 13 years, and about eight of those have been as a solo attorney. Um, however, I have kind of a unique uh, view on this because I started a solo practice, uh, like they said, right as I got out of law school, and then I also had uh, I went back to work for a firm of about 25 attorneys. I even had a brief stint with a government, uh, and then I started my own practice again in 2011. So I've seen kind of a, a different variety of practice types and uh, how they uh, compare to a solo practice and some of the things that we can draw from that and in some of the ways that they are different. But it's a great time to start a uh, solo practice uh, just because of the technology that's available, and it makes uh, it, it easier than ever as far as the entry level to get into a solo practice, and the, the playing field's been leveled somewhat uh, as far as being able to compete with larger firms. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about um, is actual office space as far as what you actually need, if you even need an office uh, at all. Um, so in our first slide here, I'm going to go over some of the factors that you should consider uh, before deciding what exact office space you should go with. Uh, the first of which is the size of your firm. Now, a lot of this is going to depend on whether you are you know, a new lawyer, like I was when I started my first practice, getting ready to uh, jump out on your own, and it's just going to literally be just you, or if you are coming from an established practice of maybe a larger firm, and you're actually going to have staff with you. Um, that will obviously impact the type of uh, office space uh, needs that you have. Um, one of the other factors is obviously cost. One of the biggest things as far as success in solo practice is really being aware and keeping track of your overhead and not overextending yourself. And office space is one of those places where uh, you can really <laughs> get in over your head as far as the expense uh, that can be involved there. So keeping an idea of what your actual budget is for uh, your office uh, space. 
Uh, the other one is the type of clientele you intend to service. Uh, you know, there's some practice areas where you'll have numerous consultations, uh, client meetings, and it's going to be necessary to have a place to meet with uh, clients on a consistent basis. There's other types of practices where it's just simply not necessary to have people in the office a lot. Uh, maybe most of your work is done online, or maybe it's just done in the courtroom. Um, so those are things to consider as well. Um, it, it may be a thing as well where you may need multiple locations. Uh, for instance, I practice in the Phoenix uh, metro area, which is a very uh, expansive. There's a lot of uh, space in between the various courthouses. And at one point, I had various uh, satellite offices set up around the metro area. So um, I, I practice in uh, bankruptcy and consumer debt type issues. And that kind of setup was important for me just so that I could be out there and uh, meeting with clients. And the next one is really the ex expectations you have as far as growth for your practice. Again, this is likely going to be uh, determined maybe whether you're a brand new lawyer starting out or whether you actually have an established book of business where, you know, if you're starting out just you, uh, you may, it may be a while before you're going to need additional space for staff or associates or anything like that. Whereas if you're coming in from a, uh, with a book of business from a law firm, you know, you may need quite a bit more room uh, to get started. Um, one thing, a little caution I would give you, uh, in my experience in working with a somewhat larger firm of about 25 attorneys is that it's important to recognize if you are leaving a larger firm to open your own practice, that solo practice is not just a smaller version of a larger law practice. It's something where the, 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 the economics of it, the needs of it, um, all of that are a lot different. And one mistake I've seen a lot of attorneys make is where they try to replicate essentially what they had uh, at the larger law firm on a smaller basis. And sometimes that's necessary and sometimes that works, but often you end up you know, overspending and creating a lot of overhead that you simply don't need in a solo practice. Let, uh, let's go over the various uh, models that are out there as far as office space goes. And the first is just the traditional office space. Uh, standalone office um, where you know you work and your staff works. Some of the benefits to this, uh, one of the main ones is that you have a designated workspace. If you have satellite offices, like I was saying, where essentially you're just using a conference room, or now we're seeing a fair number of attorneys that actually have home-based offices, um, it's really easy for the line to be blurred between you know your personal life and your work life which uh, with lawyers usually means that you know, we just end up continually working around the clock kind of thing. So uh, one of the big benefits to the traditional office space is there is a designated place where you're doing your work. Uh, the second one is that it meets client expectations. Most clients expect when they set up a, an office meeting to visit with their attorney or an initial consultation that they are going to um, go and meet you at a an actual office um, so that it'll meet the client expectations and it helps to present a more professional image uh, if you have your own office space uh, for people to go to. Um, some of the, uh, the downside. Uh, the first one is overhead. Like I said, one of the, the big things with the solo practice, in order for it to be successful, you need to keep the overhead low, especially in the beginning. And the most expensive form of office space is going to be this traditional. Um, not only that, there's a lot less flexibility. Like I was saying, you need to look at what your growth expectations are going forward. And if you plan to grow, if you're locked into a long-term lease, you know that can cause problems uh, going forward. And then that would be one of my biggest pieces of advice when it comes to, if you go with the traditional office space, is to try to keep that in uh, the lease as short as possible because, you know, things may uh, go really well. You may have to grow more quickly. Uh, hopefully things don't go poorly. <laughs> you need to uh, get out of the, the space sooner than you thought. So try to keep that lease as short as possible um, as, you're, as, you're trying, as you're negotiating that. Uh, the second uh, type that I'd like to discuss, which I see more and more attorneys doing, which is the actual home office space where you actually work out of your house. The benefits to this, uh, very low overhead. And this is something I actually did when I started uh, my second round of solo practice in 2011, is I had a designated office at my home. It wasn't somewhere where I met clients, but it was somewhere where I did my work. 
and uh, then I would travel out to various satellite offices to actually meet with clients. But the overhead is low because it's uh, you're obviously not paying rent. There's no long-term lease. Um, there also can be tax benefits to having a home office, uh, which is, wasn't something that I was aware of until I had that, and my accountant showed me that you can actually deduct uh, the square footage that you're using for work uh, there at your home. Uh, it does allow you to set your own work schedule, which uh, can be a, a benefit and a, <laughs> and a minus. Um, but it provides a lot of flexibility as far as uh, if you in, if your practice is going to be growing, um, it allows you to be able to get into a more traditional office space. You know, it's not something where you're tied to this long-term lease agreement. Now, the drawbacks to having the home office are client meetings. I have spoken to a few solo attorneys that actually do meet with clients in their home. That was something I was never comfortable with. Uh, I'm married with kids at home, and it's not something I wanted to bring people actually into our home. And a lot of people worry about that, uh, you know, the image that it portrays as far as if someone calls into the office, wants to set up a consultation, and there's not a place for you to meet. So you're meeting uh, in a conference room somewhere or meeting at your home. Um, that can be an issue. It also brings up some staffing issues in that uh, unless you're going to have somebody working in your home with you, uh, you're going to be looking at having contract uh, uh, staff or somebody working off-site, which can work, and I did that. It just adds an extra layer of uh, management you know, to your plate as far as being able to get all the systems in place to be able to make that work. And I can tell you that for me, one of the biggest drawbacks to the home office was, uh, which, like I mentioned before, the, there really was no line between home and work life. Uh, the, you know, it was great that the overhead was low, and it was important early on that I kept the overhead low. But the fact that, uh, you know, I, I, I found myself working nonstop, which I like a lot of attorneys do, just because it was so easy to jump into the office instead of being, you know, present with, you know, like my children. Um, and uh, focusing on them, I would find myself in the office working. And so th that can be a, a drawback to the uh, uh, to the home office, but it definitely is uh, cheap, and it's a great way to get started if you are um, just getting started out on your own. Let's talk about some of these uh, hybrids. Now, th this is really the setup that I had. I had the home office with access to a conference room. And what I did is I actually found various uh, different suites throughout our metro area that would rent out conference room space either on an hourly basis or for a small monthly fee. I could pay it and have, you know, so many hours per month that they would rent that out. Uh, again, the benefits to that, it kept overhead very low. There was no long-term lease involved in it. It was usually about... Um, usually just a couple months, and it was a great place to meet with clients. It was an office place uh, you know, where they could actually come, and um, it presented well. Uh, the drawbacks were that I was traveling a lot and, um, again, staffing issues, and uh, it really a lot of the same drawbacks that we had with the, the home office. Uh, another one is a shared space. Uh, where you're sharing a space with a bunch of other attorneys. Uh, benefits there, shared overhead, uh, particularly the office equipment, which can get expensive. Some places will have shared staffing um, and a more uh, professional environment, again, to meet with clients. Now, th this isn't something that I have done, and I know, Jim, you said you had a, you're actually involved in this kind of space right now. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm in a shared and space it, now. And what are your thoughts as far as uh, shared space and the pros and cons there? I think for a solo just starting out, it is also a very good option um, because it's relatively inexpensive. You don't have to commit to the long-term lease that comes with the you know the standalone office space. Um, also, you can pay less because maybe you're only renting one office as opposed to the entire space. There's a lot of common area. And they also give me access to a conference room that I use to meet with clients. There's actually two conference rooms to meet with clients or for anything else that I want to use them for. Um, and so it's, it's actually a really great arrangement. The thing I would watch out for there is um, there's some of these bigger corporate entities that, that own some of these spaces, and you need to be careful with them because they can really nickel and dime you, and they have very strong leases. Um, they actually call them, um, they're, uh, they're not leases, I, I forget the term, they're, they're, they're contracts, they're basically um, contracts, they somehow get around the whole lease provision um, that can be written very favorably in favor of them. 
um, and, and so you can have some problems there. The company that I rent from is actually a locally owned company here in Cary, North Carolina, and, um, and they're very family friendly and they love all their tenants and they want to take care of all of us and it's actually a really good arrangement. There's probably 20 attorneys here. And, and that's a good point you bring up uh, with having other attorneys there, particularly if you're a young attorney uh, getting ready to start your own practice, which I, you know, they mentioned I, I do a weekly podcast where I talk to a lot of uh, other attorneys, and I'm seeing that more and more where attorneys are making the jump into their own practice right out of law school. If you if you don't have a lot of experience, um, this kind of arrangement could be very uh, beneficial just because there's other attorneys there who you could uh, bounce ideas off of. Um, and that really leads into the last one, which are incubators, which we are seeing more and more of. Uh, the ABA actually has a list of current programs. These are programs where they will offer you office space, oftentimes for free, and really help you to get up and going. And there's other attorneys there to help mentor you uh, through this process. Um, so uh, if you just uh, Google the American Bar Association incubator list, uh, they have a bunch of lists with descriptions of those programs. Um, the next thing that we want to talk about is hiring staff. And really, again, factors that you need to consider, uh, the first of which is do you really have a need for staff at this point? Again, that will be de uh, determined by the type of uh, book of business that you already have and what kind of workload you're going to be uh, bringing on. Uh, it will also um, know that it, it adds a huge cost um, to the overall overhead of your practice. And it's not just the salary. You know, there's the salary, there's the payroll taxes, there's additional space requirements that you need, and then equipment, which is something that the first time I brought on employees, I, I didn't realize all those other things and how much they really add up as far as uh, total overhead. Um, it does make you more efficient. But if you are a new attorney without a bunch of clients, you may have a lot of time, but maybe not a lot of money. So this would make more sense uh, to just work on your own, where if you do have a lot more clients, uh, you'll be a lot more efficient. And I can tell you that's when I my practice really I felt started being profitable is when I was able to bring on staff to help me with a lot of the administrative tasks. Um, there are staffing alternatives, which we'll go over, uh, particularly with a contract type of staff uh, that could help you with various administrative uh, tasks. Um, there are HR issues, and this was something that I completely underestimated before hiring an employee, is uh, how much time would be dedicated to uh, working with employees, dealing with employee problems, and uh, resolving issues related uh, to the employees that I had. All right. Um, so in terms of the question, do you really need the staff, which we, I think we've kind of touched on this already, looking at your current workload, if you're transferring cases with you. Um, you know, if you don't have staff, you've got to ask yourself if you're comfortable in doing the, all the administrative tasks, um, you know, answering your own phones, uh, doing all the mailings. Um, all those things which take a ton of time, which you may uh, have taken for granted, particularly if you've worked at uh, another firm. Um, the overhead considerations, uh, which I talked about there, I, I didn't bring up before, but there's the benefits issue, you know, determining if you're going to offer benefits, uh, paid time off. Uh, all of those things go into uh, increasing the overhead significantly beyond just the, uh, the underlying salary. Uh, there's also training issues. If you want to hire someone who is uh, very well trained, like as far as like a paralegal, those people are very expensive, uh, at least compared to maybe someone who doesn't have that training. Uh, not as they're not near as expensive, but there's quite a bit of uh, training that you are going to have to do. And uh, hiring the right candidate is a definite skill. It's something that you should read up on and try to educate yourself on prior to getting into uh, hiring an employee. Because hiring the wrong employee can be a very expensive experience uh, for your firm. Um, efficiency. Uh, again, I mean, it's obvious they will make you more efficient. They'll take a lot of the administrative things off of your plate. Um, the, um, your case volume will be limited with no staff. And that, that's really when I made the decision to start bringing on staff is once I got to a point where I realized it was costing me money not to have uh, an employee there to help me. Staffing alternatives. There are contractors out there um, who can work remotely to be able to help you with the various tasks. 
Uh, one of the main ones that a lot of lawyers use uh, for answering telephones is Ruby Receptionist. They are an off-site uh, company that will answer uh, your phones and uh, transfer that to you or take messages. Services like that, I use that company uh, personally, and uh, it really took a load off just to not be the person who had to answer the phone, and I think it also adds to the professionalism uh, as far as the image that, that your firm is uh, presenting. Uh, the HR issues, uh, again, hiring employees, all of those things uh, take time, and they are a definite skill. Um, I have had the unfortunate experience of firing employees. Uh, not fun. The, this is a situation where, um, you know, it, it's tough on you, it's tough on them, and it's expensive uh, to fire employees and have to hire someone to retrain them. So these are just all considerations that you need to be looking at when it comes time to deciding whether you want to add staff. And I'm going to touch briefly on some marketing issues, um, and then Jim is going to go into a little bit more depth. Uh, but this is the big concern that everybody has as far as just getting the phone to ring. And I'm going to talk about content marketing, uh, particularly the blogging and video portion, and then Jim will talk about the uh, podcast. Um, uh, the first one is blogging. And blogging is one of the main ways which I have gotten clients for my practice. Um, I write regularly on a blog that's part of my law firm practice about topics uh, that my clients would find valuable and informative. And my advice to you, if you, and I, I think you need to write, if you're going to attract clients this way, that you need to write with your audience in mind. I see way too many lawyer blogs out there that are seem like they're written for courts or for other attorneys and not really with their potential clients in mind. But uh, one of the greatest things about blogging is the relationship you can build with potential clients before they even come in uh, to your office. You know, if you if you blog consistently and you're effective at it, you'll see that as clients come in, they'll say things like, you know, I feel like I already know you because I've read uh, your work online. Um, and then once the articles have been written, they can be published via social media uh, to get wider exposure for your uh, writing. Uh, the next way is video. Uh, video is one of the most powerful ways uh, to bring potential clients in. Now, uh, the way that I do it, uh, because I know that this sounds like a lot of work, I actually write an article uh, for my blog, uh, you know, five to seven hundred words, and then I will turn that into a short video, which I will uh, publish to YouTube. And I can tell that since I've started doing that, almost without exception, when people come in for a consultation, they mention the videos. They often don't mention the blogs, but they'll mention the videos. And they'll talk about how much they appreciate it, how helpful it was. And it really, it, like I said, it creates that relationship of trust before you even had a chance to meet them because they've spent some time getting to know you through these different mediums. Um, it's not necessary to outsource videos. A lot of people will pay a lot of money to get videos made. But really, all that's needed is a camera, a tripod. Um, I have some very inexpensive lights, um, a mi microphone, and then um, I actually use a teleprompter to make this whole thing go a lot quicker. And if you have an iPad, there are a dozen different teleprompter apps that you can download, and uh, you can use your iPad as a teleprompter. And it makes it so you can really do a lot of videos very quickly. Um, uh, like I said, really, I just read over the blog posts that I have. Um, I put those in the teleprompter, record them, and then upload them to YouTube. Um, videos tend to be more effective if they are in the two to three minute range. If they get much longer than that, you see that people start dropping off and don't actually finish the entire video. And again, these can be distributed through uh, your firm website, YouTube, and social media. All right, keys to success in wrapping this up uh, for content marketing is that uh, you must be consistent on this. Uh, again, I see a lot of attorneys that I work with that they will uh, write a blog post and then the next one will come back, you know, three or four months later. This is something that you've got to be consistent with and dedicated to putting, you know, two to three articles a week up uh, to make it worth your while. Again, writing with your potential client in mind. And don't worry about the SEO, just write the stuff. Too many attorneys try to worry about the technical part of it. If you write uh, articles that are helpful to your client, uh, you'll find the people will come and they'll, they'll react to it positively. All right. 
And with that, I think uh, we're going to turn the next part of this over to Jim. All right. Well, thanks, John. That was great information. Um, the one thing I will say uh, with the video also, if you're not comfortable in getting in front of a camera, you can also use screencast software to um, to do presentations and record that. And, um, and that's a good way that I know a lot of people start. Um, but as far as what I'm going to cover today, um, and before I get into that, I also want to thank Lexis for having us on today. This is this is a, a great little webinar they're doing, and um, I appreciate being invited to, to do this. Uh, if you have questions, there's a Q&A box. Um, there should be a Q&A box on your screen. I've already seen a couple questions come in. We're going to reserve about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation, at the end of the hour, to, to answer those questions. So um, if you do have questions, just make sure to type them in. And even though we're not answering them right now, we see them, and we'll be answering them at the end of the presentation. So what I'm going to cover is three things. Number one, how to build clients for your work, technology that, that you really should have and use in your law practice if you're a solo, and then um, uh, some other types of marketing, including social media, blogging, podcasting, Facebook ads, networking, um, and Google ads. So let's start with um, how to build clients. So there's a couple different types of billing arrangements. and um, they really, they really break it down into hourly, flat fee, contingent fees, um, hybrid fees, and retainers. And really, these are going to vary based on the practice area you choose. Although I will say I see more and more people that are moving towards um, flat fee um, or hybrid fee type of situations. Um, because, for, to be honest, a lot of clients like those better because they know if they pay a certain amount, they're going to get a certain result. Um, you know, with me in an intellectual property practice, you know, flat fee makes a lot of sense. Um, I've also moved to a, a different type of uh, relationship I'm going to talk about here in a second for some of my business clients. But that's something that I see more and more people doing. Most of the big law firms are still doing the hourly billing, and I see uh, a lot of clients coming to me because they're not happy about that arrangement or they um, they have friends or, or, or loved ones that, that are using an attorney at a, at a bigger uh, law firm like that and their, their bills are just astronomical and they don't necessarily see the value in that. So um, with all the, the other types of programs that are out there, the legal zooms, the rocket lawyers and, and these type of services that are providing um, basically do-it-yourself uh, services for clients, um, you know, you have to be really cognizant of that and know that if you you have to believe that you're competing with these type of services for some of these clients. Um, a lot of lawyers will try and say that's not the case, but it but it certainly is something you need to be aware of. Um, in terms of the types of fees that you're going to charge in your practice, make sure you check with your state bar uh, just to make sure that whatever billing arrangement you do choose is permissible where you practice. And so one of the ways that I'm um, uh, I'm using a subscription-based billing model with my business practice. And basically what that is um, is a model where uh, a client hires me and they pay a set amount of money each month, uh, basically like a monthly retainer, for me to do certain things for them. And if they need just a few things done, the, the fee is going to be less than if they need a whole lot of stuff done, that it, the, the retainer could be several thousand dollars a month. It just depends on what the individual client needs. It's really a form of value-based billing. And uh, where I practice in North Carolina, it is acceptable, it provided you use the right terminology in the employment contract, and you have an employment contract. But you have to be aware that more and more people are paying for these things on subscription. Um, you know, like Amazon Prime is a subscription a subscription service, Spotify, Pandora for music, these are subscription services. The case management software that you might be using in your practice, if you're using a MyCase or a Rocket Matter or a Clio or something like that, those are all subscription-based services. And of course, Box and Dropbox. Anything that you pay a fee on a recurring monthly or annual basis is a subscription-based service. Um, clients like it because they understand it, and they're, they're used to doing this in other areas of their life. Um, as I mentioned before, it can vary based on the level of the work that's required. Um, and it's really great for attorneys in particular because you can basically budget months in advance. Um, you know, you know based on the number of clients and how much the recurring fees are what you're going to get in revenue um, in any given month. And so you can kind of factor that in when you're trying to, to grow or hire staff, like John said, or, or get new office space. Um, and it's also great for practices that are going to be relationship-based. So if you're going to, if somebody's going to hire you, 
and you're going to be working with them for for many years into the future. It's a great it's a great way to do it. Um, it's especially good. Um, it, it wouldn't necessarily be good. I'm sorry. In situations where um, you know it's transaction based. Another benefit is you don't have to worry about monthly invoicing because you can set up a recurring payment through a PayPal or Stripe or something like that, and um, and then you're off to the races. There are some cons though. Uh, you're not going to collect as much money up front. Um, Cash flow would be difficult at the beginning, so if you're a solo and you want to do it this way, and you know you need to, um, and you're worried about paying expenses, you know, hiring somebody paying you $300 a month is not going to be as great as somebody coming in and paying you a $3,000 flat fee payment. Um, so for cash flow, it can be hard at the beginning. So if you're a solo and you're just starting out, you may want to start with a flat fee and then move to something like this as you have more uh, clients coming in the door. You need to, as I said before, check with your state bar to make sure you structure your contracts properly. And it's different and new. So a lot of lawyers are not going to like it. Um, I've talked to other lawyers about it. They think I'm crazy for doing it. But I know a lot of attorneys that are actually doing it and being very successful with this. Um, <clears throat> technology issues is the next thing that I want to talk about. And this is the technology um, that you really must have in your law practice. So before you use any type of technology, you need to ask yourself, um, what can you use technology for? Um, the technology you need and uh, shiny object syndrome. So these are three of the things that we're going to talk about today. So first of all, what can you use technology for? Well, basically, you can use it for everything. It really evens the playing field between you and the bigger law firms that are out there. Um, in terms of uh, what you can do for your clients and what your clients and how you're interacting with your clients, um, you can use it for your back office um, work for for uh, for people that are working for you. You can use it uh, for your sales and marketing to automate that. You can use it to build in law firm systems. You can use it for your case management. You can use it for referral management. There's all sorts of things you can use technology for. It's really a different world um, right now than it was. Uh, 20 years ago with attorneys practicing law. Uh, some of the, the things that you can use in the back back office, you can use a case management system. Now, you need to consider when you're starting out if you want cloud-based versus server-based. I, uh, I would suggest that if you're a solo just starting out, a cloud-based model is going to be better because it's less expensive. It's a subscription model. You pay monthly. But you're typically going to pay per user. So when you're just starting out, you're going to pay pay less. When you get more people working for you, then you'll pay more. Um, the other thing you don't have to worry about is with a server-based model, you're hosting something on your server. So there's, it's very heavy into technology, and you may need somebody to you know, help implement that for you. And if there's a problem with your server, then the, the system goes down. In cloud-based models, they update automatically. Um, why you need case management? Um, you need it to work for you. Uh, you need something that is going to sync your calendar and your, your email. Um, all these cloud-based uh, case management programs do this. Um, you need it to find something. You need it to, to help you access whatever you need, wherever you need it. So if you're in court, a deposition, CLEs, vacation, you know, if you're in court and the judge asks you, you know, if you're available on this date for a conference, you need to be able to look at your phone right away and say, yes, I can do that, because you can access whatever appointments are on your case management system. Even if your assistant you know, at the office just took a call from somebody and scheduled something on your calendar you know, five minutes before, it's going to be updated on your smartphone. You need to have that flexibility built in. Um, it's also great. One of the things I love about case management systems is you can use them to help keep everyone up to date with the status of the cases. That's not only you and your staff, but that also can be your clients. Um, so the program that I use uh, is my case, and it has a client portal built in. So every time I update something or upload a document to the program, my clients get an email um, telling them they can come and look at it. So that saves a lot of money on postage. Um, so there's there's some uh, popular programs out there. Clio I already mentioned, Rocket Matter I mentioned, and my case is what I use. Um, Server-based programs, there are ones that are great. I have used Time Matters. I used it um, when I practiced in Florida about 10 years ago. Um, that was really before the cloud-based programs were coming um, were becoming mainstream. Amicus Attorney is another one, um, and and the, and there's more. There's there there's just a ton of these programs out there. Uh, Practice Panther is another one that I think is cloud-based that I just heard of somebody else is using. 
let's see. So in terms of sales and marketing, the different type of software you can use for that. Um, Infusionsoft is a big one. This is kind of like a, a you know, a big behemoth, very powerful program. It might be more than you need when you're just getting started, but it is a great program to have. Um, and hold on one second. I feel like I skipped a slide. Oh, okay, we did. Somehow we skipped the slide. So if you're using sales and marketing, um, the one thing I'm looking for with sales and marketing software is to help you automate your marketing and your back office tasks um, and build systems into your law practice. Um, and what do I mean by automate? What I mean by automate is uh, you want to develop a system for every time somebody comes to the door, you want to have a system in place for what is going to happen with that file from the minute um, they come in the door, and actually from before when they come in the door to all the way through when they when they leave your office um, uh, forever. So you want to have systems in place, checklists in place of everything that needs to happen at every step of the representation. And software can help you with that. Um, and so what you basically do is if you have a really powerful software program like the Infusionsoft that I just talked about, you can basically take all these checklists and tasks, and you can put them into the case management program. And so the case management program will tell you exactly what needs to happen at what step of the representation. And that's the beauty of having um, technology on your side here. So Infusionsoft, I already mentioned, is a great one. Entreport is another one that does a lot of the same things as Infusionsoft. Um, it's a little bit more user friendly. Both of these programs are fairly expensive, so you need to be, be careful about that. Salesforce is one that I know some attorneys are using with some success. I've never used it personally, um, but and I don't, I don't know much about it, but I know it's a, a big program out there that a lot of people like. Uh, Lexicata is a new one that is on the market. Um, they're kind of a, a startup, and I've heard some good things about them as well, although, again, I've never used them. Um, I think it's kind of a dumbed-down version of Infusionsoft is really what I've been told it is. Um, these programs are going to be very pricey, um, but again, they're going to be very robust, and they're going to save you a lot of time, and they're going to save you a lot of headache, and in a lot of cases, they can replace a staff person in your law firm. So they can do the work automatically that, that one staff person might be able to do um, in terms of sending out emails, in terms of follow-up, in terms of uh, you know following up with referral sources, um, you know you can automate fulfillment tasks like sending out letters and postcards. Um, you can obviously automate emails. So they're really powerful programs. So other software you can use um, to do similar types of things are Aweber, Mailchimp. Those are cheaper autoresponders. If you don't have an autoresponder in your practice, you really need to set something up and automate and send out weekly emails to people on your um, prospect list. Um, and Lead Pages is a, is a software tool that you can use to basically set up landing pages that when somebody goes to your website, you can have some sort of opt-in or ethical bribe um, that they would want to get. And it's basically usually going to be some sort of informational piece uh, that they can use to educate them about the type of work you do. And then they're on your email list, but they have to give their email address to get that, that, that item. I'm sure most of you have, have done this um, at least somewhere. And then you'll get email follow-up from them. And, and, and so you're, you're going to be sending email follow-up based on the people that are on your list. Uh, document management programs that you can use. Box.com is an enterprise level solution. That's what I use for all my document management. Um, I love it. I have unlimited storage space. And you know I've got a file for every client. I've got admin files. I've got marketing files. Um, and it's great. It does sync with, I believe, Clio. Um, and it might sync with Rocket Matter. It does not sync with my case at the moment. Um, so I just upload the documents to both files. Uh, Dropbox is another one that also syncs with some of these case management programs. Um, that's great, especially if you have staff that works remotely. Um, Evernote does the same type of thing. <clears throat> Schedule Once is a program that I absolutely love. It automates all my scheduling. So you can basically um, have an automated email send out to it. So let's say somebody. Uh, fills out a contact form on your website. They say they want to schedule a time to talk to you. Um, 
you can send them an automated email and include a link to your Schedule Once um, calendar where it will go back to them. They'll click on that link. They can pick a time on your calendar, and, um, and then you can automatically, automatically schedule the call. That's why I'm saying you can kind of replace some of the staff in your office. So as opposed to somebody calling the phone, trying to find a time that works, having to get a call returned, you know, it all happens automatically. It's somewhat less personal, um, but we live in a world where um, this is what clients want. So um, this is where we, we, can, we can go with that. CoSchedule is one that I actually learned about from John. And this is a scheduler. Um, it organizes your blog posts. Anytime I have an idea of something I want to write, I basically go right to CoSchedule. And I put a blank blog post in there and just write the title and some notes about what I want to write about. And then whenever I'm ready to write my blog post, I go to that list of things, I pick one out, and I start plugging away at it. It's a great way to um, organize your um, blog marketing. So let's see. So some other software you can use, and I'm seeing with the time, I'm going to rush through these a little bit. Google Apps is a great one. Um, Rev SpeakWrite for transcription. Rev is a great program. I think it charges you a dollar a minute. Um, to transcribe what you speak, it uses with it, it works with your smartphone. It's great. You get them back in like 15, 20 minutes. I think they say 24-hour turnaround, but it's a lot faster than that in my experience. Um, Slack can be used for office communications and file sharing between your office, um, as opposed to uh, jamming up your email with a lot of different emails from with a lot of different subjects. Um, you can kind of do all that with Slack, which is I think free and very inexpensive if you need a more enterprise-level solution. Stripe PayPal for payment processing. I already talked about that. Adobe Premiere Suite is um, I use Adobe Premiere. I use it for um, I use Adobe Audition to do my podcast processing. They also have video processing. They've got a whole suite of products you can use. It's like fifty bucks a month. EchoSign is another one. It basically allows you to send out contracts and have them signed electro electronically. WordPress obviously for blogging. Um, and Avo, JD Super, I know these are two big things that, that John, that you enjoy using um, and have used extensively in your practice. So in terms of marketing tools, all right. So the wave of the future really is, you know, John talked about video and um, and blogging, I want to talk about podcasting. And most lawyers either don't know what podcasting is or they know and they're scared of it. Um, you really shouldn't be. Um, oh, let me see. Before I get into that, the other types of things I'm going to talk about are Facebook ads, networking, and then other platforms that you should pay attention to. And I put an asterisk next to Snapchat because, yes, I'm not kidding about that. Um, it's something you should look at, especially if you're, hand, if you're working with millennials. Um, or anyone that's in the online space as clients, um, you know, think 20-some-year-old kid who got a DUI. Uh, that's um, that's something. Uh, Snapchat is something you might want to do. So first, podcasting. Um, I wish I don't think we can do surveys here. I'd like to know how many people have, out there have listened to a podcast. I suspect that most of you probably have. Um, there's few other mediums out there where you can listen to somebody for 20 minutes at a time, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, um, and, and, uh, and you can really get in somebody's ear for that long. Um, the, the applications for divorce clients, bankruptcy, criminal law, any practice area where people don't necessarily want to know that they're looking for lawyers, it's a great uh, medium to reach those people and get a lot of information to them. The benefits are people can listen anywhere. They can listen in the car while they're doing the dishes, in the shower. I actually have a waterproof speaker in my shower. I listen in the mornings um, while you're walking the dog, working out. Podcasts are great. And you can also basically listen to any type of stuff you want. So, um, uh, and, and podcast players are already in the cars. I mean, you chances are you probably have one. If you don't have one, if you have a Bluetooth connection in your car, um, then you have a podcast player in your car because you can listen to podcasts through your phone. Um, <clears throat> they're really super cheap to start, under $100, and you're, you're online, and the technology is honestly not that hard. You can do it with a $20 mic from Amazon and uh, free uh, uh, software that you can download onto your computer, and, and that's basically it. And then pay 5 bucks a month to Libsyn for hosting, and, and you're good to go. Um, now, what I will say is most lawyers either don't, like I said before, don't know what a podcast is or they are afraid of it. 
but uh, the, the benefit to you with that is it's the wild, wild west. Anybody can come in there and basically own a space if they're doing a podcast on it. Facebook ads are, people are making millions right now off Facebook ads. Um, they're huge. Uh, a lot of lawyers are late to the party. I'm not seeing a whole lot of lawyers running Facebook ads, and you really should be. It's a great way to promote your content to, um, to audiences for as little as $5 a day. Um, and uh, basically what you're doing is, so I'm running an ad right now where I'm basically sending, I've got a, this really epic blog post. It's like two or 3,000 words. And what I do is I, for $5 a day, I send traffic to that blog post. I'm not looking for any type of conversion. I'm just sending traffic to that blog post. I get probably 25, 30 clicks a day off that $5. And those are people that are signing up for my, my email list. Um, they're, they're, they're reading more content. They're calling my firm. And they are, um, uh, you know, basically I'm repixelating, I'm pixelating them um, through Facebook so that then when I do have additional offers, webinars, and things like that, I can send advertising directly to them for those services after they've already been to my website. So it's a really super powerful platform. Um, so there's obviously a right way and a wrong way to do Facebook ads. Um, and, and here's kind of the funnel that I just kind of mentioned. First of all, you need to make sure you sign up through business.facebook.com. You don't want to do this through your personal account. Um, you want to promote a piece of content, as I just mentioned. Think of a really strong, in-depth blog post, something that you're really proud of. That's what you want to promote. Um, put the tracking pics on that website, and then create some sort of opt-in bribe, like a lead magnet, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation. Follow up that first ad with an ad for the lead magnet, and that's how you get people on your list. They're going to be much more likely to opt in to your lead magnet after they've already been warmed up by going to your website. Um, and then you can follow up with them with helpful information via email. Don't push them to make an appointment. Don't try and solicit them. Don't try to sell them. Be helpful. Anything else than that is spam, and you don't want to do that. Um, and a lot of people ask, is this ethical? <clears throat> Can you do this? And comment one to rule 7.3 of the ABA model rules of professional conduct says that you can't solicit. Everyone knows that you can't solicit clients. But what you can do is um, a lawyer's communication typically does not constitute a solicitation if it is directed to the general public, as a Facebook ad would be, such as through a billboard, an internet banner and advertisement, a website, or a television commercial, or if it is in response to a request for information. And so that's the key here, is a response to request for information. So when somebody goes to your website and they opt in and ask for your information, um, you can email market them. As long as you're not being misleading, you can send them information um, that's helpful to them and beneficial to them, and that's how um, you get around worrying about the ethical rules, because it is completely ethical. And actually, it should be encouraged, because you're providing a service to the public. So as long as you're not misleading, um, you're not soliciting, and you're not violating any ethical rules. So other marketing methods, um, uh, networking, um, sec, networking, individualized and targeted approach. I think those are, that taking people out to coffee, lunch, dinner is better than uh, you know going to these bar meetings uh, once a quarter and just kind of seeing the same old people all the time. You know, I think one-on-one, -on -one, getting to know people and, and learning about their business and seeing how you can help them is a better approach than uh, going to these big networking meetings. That's not to say there's not a place for these big networking meetings, um, but the one-on-one -on -one approach for me personally works better. Um, the follow-up is the key. So um, you're meeting with these people and then uh, following up with them and letting them know that, uh, that you're, you care about them and you want to help them and you want them to succeed, um, they'll reciprocate and try and take care of you too. That's the way I approach networking. And that's a really dumbed down approach, but that's basically it. Um, the other social media you should be attention, paying attention to, Periscope. Um, if any of you follow Mitch Jackson, um, he's an attorney out in California, and he does a really great job with Periscope. I think he's scoping is what it's called um, at least once a day or every other day. Um, it's basically live streaming on the Internet. It's pretty powerful. Facebook Live is coming. It's the same type of thing. 
Right now, you can get it as an individual, but you can't get it for your business um, unless you're special. I think there are some people that are getting it. The bigger marketers are getting it for their business, but they'll roll it out to everyone else here at some point. Snapchat, you can follow me at jimhart518 to see what I'm doing. I basically uh, send out snaps. Um, they can be global snaps. They're live for 24 hours and basically give information and helpful tips and guidance. And if you're, like I said, since I'm dealing with online entrepreneurs, my online entrepreneur uh, friends and clients are on Snapchat, so I want to be on Snapchat too. You want to go where your clients are. If they're not on Snapchat, then you don't need to worry about it. Uh, LinkedIn is another great resource. So um, let's see. Thank you. That's it. That's all I've got for today. Um, and I guess, so John, I guess we're ready to do questions. Yeah, it looks like we have a list of questions. and. Um, I guess we could grab a few of these in, in those last 10 minutes. Um, I, I can start off. One of the questions we got is, should the blog be on its own website, or should you have your uh, standalone blog hosting? Essentially, you have the blog away from the law firm website. You know, my, my you're, you're going to get differing opinions on this, um, because I know that there are some people that say that the blog should be uh, away from the law firm website, that it should not be uh, something that, you know, if they're, if they're going to, like, my law firm is skibala.com, if you go there, they're saying the blog shouldn't be part of that. My opinion on that is I think that the blog should be uh, a part of your law firm website if your purpose in blogging is that you want to drive traffic to your website. And, and that's what, you know, there's all these things I heard that we're talking about as far as the social media, uh, the different platforms, and the video, and the podcasting. The whole goal is really to drive people to your home base, which is your law firm website. And that's what I use a blog for, is that I want the topics I write on are topics that, uh, you know, they're questions that my clients have as, as far as a particular uh, legal issue. And so I want, I use my blog as, it's actually front and center. I have it on the home page. And so I, want, I use it as a way to drive traffic to my site. Now, I know that there's some attorneys that use a blog for totally different purposes. You know, they use it for more of uh, their platform to kind of give their opinion on legal issues or to talk about the latest, uh, you know, case of the day or whatever. Uh, if you're doing that, then yeah, I think it should be separate. If you're, if it's something more just for you to interject your opinion into current legal events. But if you're using it for content marketing, if you're using it to drive traffic to your site, my opinion is that it, the blog definitely needs to be part of your law firm website. Uh, otherwise, the, the law firm website is kind of just like a brochure. You know, it just gives you directions of where it's at and it gives you a bio. I think that the uh, blog content on a law firm site really gives us some vitality. And I, I don't know what your thoughts. Maybe you have something different on that, Jim. No, I think you said it exactly right. The only other comment I would make is that, um, and I don't know if Scott was asking it. I think you, I, I read the question differently, but I think you interpret it correctly. Um, I, I was wondering if he was talking about having it on your own website or basically like a, you know, some sort of blog website, you know, like a, um, like WordPress dot, um, Org or something like that. Um, I would I would make sure you have it on a self-hosted blog, and I would if you like I, like you said, John, if you're doing it to promote your law firm, you want to have all that content um, directed at um, or on your law firm web page. And and so basically, you use blog posts to to do local news news and and tips and advice and practical guidance for your for your blog, and then you use the pages um, to do more like. Uh, you know, standalone about me pages and, and, and things like that. So that's the way I would do it with my website. So um, you want me to take this next one, I guess? Or, uh, sure, go ahead. I see, go ahead uh, I see um, Nicole asks, how do you protect yourself from clients saying your blog said and therefore the advice is bad and is not specific to the case? This is pretty easy. Um, you need to have a terms and conditions. You need to have two things on your website. You need to have a privacy policy. That's required by law. If you're not doing that, you're breaking the law. Um, and in a lot of states, uh, you can get in big trouble for not doing that. And you also need to have a terms and conditions uh, policy on your website, um, as well as a third thing, which is a legal disclaimer. So what I do is I put a legal disclaimer in my terms and conditions, and then I have another standalone page that's a legal disclaimer that basically tells people this is not you know, this is not legal advice. You should con consult with an attorney, blah, 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 blah. You can go to hawthornlaw.net and see what I've done. Um, feel free to, 
you know, review that and if it, and, and use any of that if that's helpful to you. I don't know if you have anything different there, John. Well, can I do a disclaimer to your disclaimer? <laughs> yes. the, the, the only thing, and I, I agree with you on everything you said there, and I do the same thing on my side. I actually have a little video, an intro video that people can click on where I say, look, you know, obviously you haven't hired me. I'm not your attorney. I can't give you specific advice. Everything here is just for informational purposes. The, the only thing I'd be careful of is I sometimes I'll see attorney blogs where it's just disclaimer to death. You know, each individual post um, has a header, a footer, and I, I think that you lose some of the effectiveness of the blog post. I think it's important to have uh, the terms and conditions of the site, uh, to have some kind of disclaimer on there saying, no, this doesn't create any kind of attorney-client uh, relationship. Those things are important, but... Um, you know, just do what you need to do and then keep it within reason. I can tell you I have on my website right now, I have over 500 blog posts. I have never had this become an issue. I've never had it even come remotely become an issue as far as someone thinking that I'm their attorney um, because they read my blog or uh, that they have taken advice and come back to me and said, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. And I guess I need to reword that. I don't give out advice on the site. We just give legal information. And, uh, you know, people can do that with the, what they want. And I, yeah, I obviously agree with that. Um, Rex, you asked what was the name of the podcast host. It's Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N, dot com. And there's other ones, but that's the one. Is that what you use, John? Yes, I, I use Libsyn as well. Okay. Um, I so, guess this one would be towards me because this is what I talked about, the networking. Um, uh, we have someone asking if you can schedule coffee or lunch with clients without violating solicitation rules. You know, I mean, if the sole reason of you going to lunch with this person is try and sell them on why they should hire you as an attorney, I would say that's a solicitation. Um, that's not what I do coffee and lunches for. What I do coffee and lunches for is I take potential referral sources out to lunch to um, try and provide value to them first and ask them about their business and try and see if there's a way that I can help them and then um, with the hopes that when they have somebody in mind that they might be able to refer to me, that, that I'll be top of mind for them as well. So it's really it has to be a win-win relationship. But yeah, if you're, if you're calling up people that, you know, if you, if you get the DUI list and, and you start calling those people and asking if they want to get coffee and talk about their DUI case, I think you're going to get in trouble. Does that sound right, John? Yep, I agree with that. All right. Um, um, you want to take There's this question on Periscope. Periscope, or you want me to do it? Um, do you, uh, I, 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 I never I, use Periscope. Okay, <laughs> I talked about it. Yet. How would I recommend using it? I'll, first things, I am not. I've used Periscope, but I'm not using Periscope right now. It was something that I think it devote it demands a lot of time. Um, that's why I threw out Mitch Jackson's name because he's doing a very good job of this. You can check out what he's doing. Um, I don't know his website, but you can Google him and find him. He he uses it. Um, like I said, almost daily. But basically what you're doing is live. If you've used Periscope before, it's basically live streaming. So um, live streaming video. So you're basically going in there and just talking to your cell phone. It has to be on your, your smartphone or iPad. Um, and you're talking to it. And, and what I would do is you know, do a blog post, um, do what John said, and create a video of that blog post. And, and actually, if you want to kill two birds with one stone, instead of doing the video, go on your iPad or phone, do a Periscope session about everything that you talked about in the blog post, um, and then you can take that video, upload to YouTube, upload to Facebook, and kill you know a bunch of st bunch of stones at one time. But people will be watching you and commenting and giving you feedback in real time. That's how Periscope works. So as long as you're being helpful, I think that's that's a great thing to do and be interesting. All right, maybe we can squeeze the little, one more question in here. Uh, question is, are business cards a relic of the past? Example, dropping cards off at places and businesses that you frequent, provided that the ownership agrees. Um, I, I, I think the business card is important, and I actually use the business card. Uh, I, I've kind of jazzed it up a bit just because I think that any time that the client has something they can hold, I think it could be a you know a good way to promote your law firm. The, the reason why both I and Jim are you know we recommend the content marketing method, whether it be the various channels we've talked about, blogging, video, podcasting, whatever it is, 
is your reach is just so much greater. And if you think about your own habits when it comes to trying to find answers to questions, you know, you go to Google and you type it in and you look up the, you know, the different responses there. Your clients are doing the exact same things. So they have a legal problem. They have, they need uh, some kind of question answer. They're going to go to the internet first. And if you can write articles or videos or have a podcast that answers those particular questions is helpful and informative to them. Um, you're going to be light years ahead. So the business card is important, but the reach is very limited as far as you know, just handing that out to various businesses. I think it's important. Um, I still do some direct mailing kind of thing, which a lot of attorneys don't do. But I just think that you've got to have the internet stuff in there as well, because that's where your clients are looking for uh, answers. And the last question was from Chris um, asking about um, case management software. And I would say I use um, I use my case, love it. I don't know what you use, John. Uh, I use uh, Rocket Matter. Okay. Yeah, both good uh, both good programs. Yes. So. so I think that is our time is up. And uh, but uh, again, I want to thank Lexus Nessus for having us on and doing this. And uh, good luck with starting your new firm. Yep. And thank you as well. And I think they've got some closing comments uh, about the way this will be handled. So. Thank you both. On behalf of LexisNexis, I'd like to thank both Jim and John for today's program. Attendees, please feel free to contact them directly if you have any questions that you'd like to explore further. We would also like to encourage you to please complete the survey that will appear for you at the conclusion of today's webinar. And if you'd like to stay in touch and get helpful legal news and resources, please follow us on our Twitter feed at Lexis Small Law. Thanks to everyone, and have a great day.